And now get ready. You're going to be guided through the process of getting ready to build a new tomorrow in this year of plenty. And you're going to be ably guided and supported by Reverend John. Please help me welcome him. Good morning, family. Happy New Year and Happy New You. Just turn to your neighbor and say, Happy New Year, Happy New You. Happy New Year, Happy New You. Welcome to 2020, year of Nuff Nuff and plenty. Nedo Ram. <laughs> tough, tough. <laughs> I have titled my encouragement today, In the Beginning, God. Right. We start everything with God, yes? And what a way to step into a new year, singing a new song. It's really an old melody, but set to new words and to new lyrics as we write a new script for our lives. You know, we're doing part one today, and I think of part one as in the metaphor that Jesus often used of the agrarian society he lived in, of preparing the soil. If you're going to plant a garden, you're going to, to make, to plant vegetables or whatever, you need to prepare the soil. So today we prepare the soil, the soil of our subconscious mind that takes what we want and produces it in abundance. So that tomorrow at our workshop at six o'clock, we will plant the seeds of the plenty that we desire in 2020. And we're going to have to decide what plenty means to us, but we'll, we will get there. We have to, we're going to have to define what does plenty do? You want plenty crosses and plenty worries and plenty problems? No. no. I, one person said no. Everybody else was going, all right then. No. So then when we say thy will be done, we mean that God's will for us is all the good that we will for ourselves. Yes? So. Today, as we plant, as we, we prepare that soil, we have some important work to do because the quality of the crop is going to depend on, on, on our preparation. I began my preparations for the new year by contemplating what I believe. You know, we say the Declaration of Principles all the time in this church. But what do I really believe? And so if you look at your Declaration of Principles on the inside cover of your program, you will see that each statement of belief is now preceded by a one or two word paraphrase in caps of what our core beliefs are. I thought that would be helpful for us so that uh, when we read each, each, each statement, we can say, hey, that's talking about my belief in one God, or that's talking about my belief in my immortality. And I want to suggest that you keep a copy of this with your journal. And there are 13 statements, but if you take the first two, one God and everything is spirit, those first two statements, you will have 12. So you can contemplate and journal on how you live that belief. You can do it for 12 weeks, one every week, or as I'm doing, I'm doing one each month, looking at how God shows up in my life. How do I live what I say I believe? And I want to tell you a story of how God showed up in a busy businessman's life. A few years ago, a group of salesmen went to a regional sales convention in Chicago, Illinois. And they had assured their wives that they would be home in time for dinner on New Year's Eve or for their New Year's Eve festivities. In their rush to make their flight, because they were late from the convention, one of the salesmen accidentally kicked over a table in the airport terminal, which had a display of apples. Apples flew everywhere. And without stopping or looking back, they all managed to reach the departure gate just in time for their nearly missed boarding. All but one one of the salesmen. He paused, he took a deep breath, it troubled him deeply, and he quickly got in touch with his feelings, and he experienced a twinge, you know, you know sometimes when something just niggles at you, a twinge of compassion for what had just happened back in the terminal, for that girl whose upper stand had just been overturned. 
And so he told his buddies to go on without him, and it was the days before cell phones, so he asked one of them when he got home to call his wife and say, look, he'll be coming on a later flight. And then he returned to the terminal where there were apples all over the floor. He was glad he did. Because when he looked, the young apple vendor was totally blind. She was softly crying, tears running down her cheeks in frustration, and at the same time, helplessly groping for her spilled produce as the crowd swirled about her. No one stopping, of course, or showing concern for her plight. We do that sometimes, don't we, in our rush to go about our own business. We just have on blinkers. You know, we have to achieve this, and we go after it with, with gusto, quite unaware of whose apple cart we are upsetting and whose corns we are mashing sometimes. Guilty me, Ronna, too. The salesman knelt on the floor with her, gathered up the apples, put them back on the table, and helped reorganize her display. As he did, he noticed that many of the fruit had be become what we call in Jamaica, butter brews. They were, they were not going to be worth much in terms of sales. So he set those aside in a basket. And when he had finished, he pulled out his wallet and said to the girl, here, please take this $40 for the damage we did. Are you okay? She nodded through her tears. When we ask people, are they okay? What, what we expect? <laughs> you, yeah, you know, uh, it's really a, a, a courtesy. Are you okay? I often think I'm going to say no, <laughs> and then see what you, what you will say. Once, years ago, when I worked for the, uh, 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 the airline, we had the same thing. The flight attendants were told to go down the aisle after the meal service and say, did you enjoy your meal, madam? Did you enjoy your meal, sir? Did you enjoy your meal, madam? Well, I was on a flight to London, and this was, this was happening, you know, row after row. And one lady said, no. And he said to the gentleman beside her, did you enjoy your meal, sir? Did you enjoy your meal, madam? So. Actually, he went back as a, as a, as a um, what is called, supernumerary crew <laughs> that was taken off the flight <laughs> for being insubordinate to British Airways, valid customers. Those were in the old days. So he said, are you OK? And she kind of nodded through her tears. And he said, I hope we didn't spoil your day too badly and that you have a really wonderful new year. And as the salesman started to walk away, the bewildered girl called out to him, Mister. So he paused and turned back and looked into those blind eyes. And she continued, Are you God? Wow. I bring that question for you this morning, my friends. Are you God? You know, we say that we are one and that God is one. But are we God? And if we say yes to that, if we claim that as our divine heritage in this new year, we have to say, am I living at a level of consciousness and vibrating at a level so that people who encounter us or who we encounter get the God feeling, get that feeling that something incredible has happened because you have touched them and they have touched you. And so I've been pondering that, you know, all of this season as I prepared for tomorrow's workshop and for Christmas and the new year. If I say I'm God, if I believe that God is all there is and that everybody is part of it, how will I live from that state of consciousness that says I am truly a member of the royal household? And so friends, the, th the salesman's thoughts were just as mine have been. And, you know, in this teaching, we, we say when you're thinking about something hard, other stuff comes to you to reinforce. It's like the law of attraction brings to you more information that you may need. And so somebody sent me a WhatsApp a couple of days ago about a blind farmer in St. Elizabeth. It's an amazing WhatsApp video of this man who cult has a cultivation of yams and his favorite is cabbages. So he has a large cultivation of cabbages, all done by him. The only thing he gets help with is with the spraying. Uh, but he, he demonstrates how he goes through the cabbage uh, planting on his hands and knees, feeling his way through the sprouting um, crop. And he just 
shows his yam vines and, and his cabbages and his sweet peppers with such pride. And I thought, wow. You know, so often I feel I can't or, you know, I, I'm handicapped. <laughs> Just think about it. A blind farmer working his acres of property. Next time you buy a cabbage, maybe it's from his, his, his cabbage patch. Wouldn't that be just wonderful? And so I wondered to myself how many times I have bolted through life, upsetting people's apple, apple carts, and how many of us are truly blind to the need for love and for compassion and for, for good. Plenty of it needed in our world, particularly at this time of our history and of our, our unfoldment. And so that's my takeaway from the story. The farmer did not have to see his crops growing. He only had to prepare the soil and plant what he desired and then wait upon the law to give life to the seed. Wow, so can we in this new year emulate that faith to plant the seeds of what we want and just rely. All we have to do is to plant the seed and then rely upon the law of good to bring to fruition what our hearts desire for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our neighborhood, our community, and indeed for the entire world. And truly, Neville Goddard of Visualization University, in an article titled, At Your Command, writes, and I quote, if you will give up all your former beliefs in God apart from your, as being apart from yourself and claim God as your awareness of being, if you will claim God as your awareness of being, as Jesus and the prophets did, you will transform your world with the realization that I and my Father are one. Can we say that together? I and my Father are one together. I and my father are one. And then add, and the father is the one. So I and my father are one, and the father is the one. Together. I and my father are one, and the father is the one. Wow. When you truly embody the consciousness of your oneness with the indwelling presence and power, all things become possible, my friends. As Job 22 verse 28 assures us, ye shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways. End of that scripture. And so friends, we are going to make 2020 a year of plenty, plenty good though. Nuff, nuff good. When we decree the good we desire and plant the seeds of abundant prosperity, life-enhancing relationships, radiant good health, fulfilling self-expression, and soul-enhancing spiritual practice. Those domains, we can, yeah, those worthwhile domains to, to set our intentions for more and more and more of the goodness of God? Yes. Two answered me. <laughs> Is it worthwhile to look at those domains of self-expression and spiritual practice and enhanced relationships in, in your life and in your affairs? Yes. Yes. Thank you. The beautiful Jesus tells us in Mark 11, 24, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall receive them. Now note. The injunction to believe that you receive is in the present tense. Not believe that you are going to receive them. Believe that you receive them. This means that you must be in the nature of the things asked for before you can receive them. You have to be vibrating at the same resonance, the same level as that which you desire. And so my friends, in preparing this soil, I want to tell you that there is a weed. It's toxic. And it must be uprooted as we prepare the soil for planting the good we desire. Anybody want to take a guess what that weed is? No. No. <laughs> Those are all weeds too. Unforgiveness is a really dangerous weed. It chokes everything because you cannot grow a crop of amazing fruit, the fruits of the spirit, 
if it is being clogged and choked and strangled by resentment and old hurts and old, old feelings of unforgiveness. A general amnesty is necessary, my friends. And we are told, I quote, forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you. But if you forgive not, neither will your Father forgive you. And that Father there is not some little man sitting in a, in, on a throne up in heaven. That's the law, the way the law works. We, we know that, doesn't it? Don't we? So this does not mean that God is, is some sort of a tit-for-tat God who is pleased or displeased with your actions. Here's what it means. Consciousness being God, if you hold in consciousness anything against anyone, you are binding that condition to your own world. Notice that when you're hurt about something, you think about it over and over, and you say, me should I did say, and if I, next time I be, meet them, I'm going to say so and so, and I wish I had a memo set upon spring like John Scott, because I would have tell them where to get off, and you go over it and over it and over it in your mind, and each time you do, you are fertilizing that, that, ang that angst and that ill feeling. And it grows into a huge bush. You know, love bush in Jamaica, we have that yellow thing. It's called the dodder, I think. And when just a little scrap of it dropping on, on, on your hedge can just take over the whole of your bogan villa. It's, when you see it, get rid of it quick, quick, quick. And so your assignment for tomorrow evening, for our goal setting exercise tomorrow, is to do some weeding. Hmm. I want you to look back in mind over 2019, and without judging or condemning yourself or any other self, I want you to consider what weeds you need to uproot in preparing the soil for your harvest of plenty in 2020. What were the thoughts which you, you, which you feel to be incompatible with and unworthy of your godlikeness? When that little blind girl said, Mr. Are you God? Look at yourself and ask yourself, where in 2019, I have to think about it, 2019, were you acting out of character and out of integrity with your godlikeness? And just jot it down and bring it with you tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening, I'll tell you what to do with it if, and where to put it. <laughs> the second part of your assignment uh, my friends, has implications not just for tomorrow's workshop, but for the entire decade we are entering. Indeed, it has implications for the remainder of your life on this plane. It is an assignment given by the master teacher himself in Matthew 5, verses 38 and 39. And this is, a, a, this is one of the most misunderstood and yet one of the most powerful lessons given by the master teacher. Who says, and I quote, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not him that is evil, but whosoever smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This bothered me for years. You mean somebody box me, someone must do so, and take another one? No. In my view, my friends, the master was saying, look at the situation from the point of view of your divine persona. To turn the other cheek means to look at it from the perspective of your God self. You know, and if you're looking that way and you look, turn the cheek, you look that way. It's a whole different perspective, isn't it? Look at the situation through the perspective of your God awareness and just say to yourself, this is God dealing with God. And God cannot be divided against God because God is one. There is nothing but God. Am I right? Yes. Therefore, in fact, you know, I promised last week to give you the, the Lord's Prayer in Patwa, and I did. It's on the, the, the um, page seven of your program. And it ends with, it's from Matthew, it just doesn't have thine as a kingdom and all that. It, it ends with, and now make we face nothing where we'll cause we face sin, but protect us from the wicked one. That wicked one, my friends, is not a personality. There is no devil. That wicked one is the thoughts we have that are unworthy of our godness, of our goodness, and that prevent the crop of good 
from growing to its fruition and its, in its fullness and its beauty. I like that blind farmer in St. Elizabeth showing off his yam hills with such pride and say, look how them fluffy. We want our good to just be, be luxurious and, and enough and full and enough to share, enough to spare, enough to, to just enrich the world and to ennoble everyone with whom we come into contact. But we have to put down the resentment. The old mosaic law, you know, was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We know that. And it was designed to maintain a lawless and uncontrollable rabble of people. It was better than nothing and served its purpose in those times, but it has actually formed the basis of a moral code, which is unfortunately still evident in moral, civil, and criminal law. In Jamaica, as elsewhere in the world, we still reveal a tendency to want to get even, to even up things, as we say, when we have been hurt. And Jesus is saying, in effect, if you want to get even, that's a perfectly normal desire. However, the only way to do it is to hold, stop holding the person in enmity. Because when you hold others in enmity, you are, you are yourself in prison. You are self-manacled and chained to that resentment, and you need to let it go. So the command to turn the other cheek has been grossly misunderstood. It does not mean that we should become doormats or invite further assault. And you know, it's really funny, the people who take the Bible as inherently the word of, the word of God don't have a problem when, when Jesus gives the injunction to pluck out thine eye or cut off thy hand. They don't take it literally. They know it, he's speaking metaphorically. So why wouldn't we think, too, that the, the injunction to turn the other cheek is also a metaphor? It doesn't mean literally to let somebody beat you up on the other side as well. We have to look beyond what Jesus is saying in the Bible to the imagery and the, and the, the beautiful pictures he paints for his hearers and, for, and the people who, of his time. And so he, he talks in these metaphors that are so beautiful, and we have to interpret them for our time. So the master teacher meant that, and he remember he discovered the divinity within all of us. He's telling us that if we find ourselves upset over something another person has done or not done, or upset indicates that we have been in the wrong state of consciousness. And you cannot handle an upset from the same state of consciousness that caused it, because what do you do? You create more of the same. So you look at it from the point of view of your God awareness and say to yourself, how would my God self respond to this? And out of that will come your ability to bless, to forgive, and to look beyond other people's mistakes and other people's upsetting of your apple cart and help them pick up the mess, clean up the mess, and move on to live the life more abundant. Eric Butterworth, in his book, Discover the Power Within You, tells the story of a man who was spending some time with a friend who was a Quaker. And each evening, the two friends would walk to the corner to buy the newspaper. The Quaker would be pleasant, but the newsy would always reply with a grunt. The Quaker's friend commented one night, he's a quite unpleasant fellow, isn't he? And the Quaker replied, eh, he's always that way. So his friend asked, so why are you nice to him then? And the answer is a classic that reflects the deep understanding of Jesus' teaching that we should turn the other cheek by looking at it from our God self. The Quaker replied, but why should I let him determine how I am going to act? So you see, my friends, we can't let the world dictate who we are. We have to let that consciousness of our oneness with the one hold us. And so as we hold on to it and say, I am God, and this is how God looks at the world, sees the world, experiences the world as beauty, as truth. So here was a man, the Quaker, whose chief responsibility in life was to act the part of his own divinity, not to worry about how other people behave. My friends, we can make 2020 a year of plenty by cultivating the kind of consciousness that ensures that we don't flare up and re react to things on the same level of consciousness that caused them. We can turn the other cheek and simply affirm, my every encounter is an opportunity 
to raise consciousness. Can we say that together? My every encounter is an opportunity to raise consciousness. That is what we are about this year. Remember, you may not be able to change or control the people around you, but you can determine the level of consciousness in which you meet them and interact with them. Turn the other cheek and meet the experiences of 2020 on the level of your own divinity. Clear the soil, prepare the soil in the garden of your consciousness today by looking at the weeds and beginning to pull them out. And I know there are times when Jesus' teaching seems too demanding. He tells us it is not enough to stop hating. We must go the extra mile and start loving. It is not enough to let a matter drop. We must actually forgive everyone involved, including ourselves. Sometimes ourselves are the ones that are in the, 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 the highest need of forgiveness. I sometimes forgive myself for just being vexed. You know, a taxi man bad driving in halfway tree on, on the last day of the... The, the old year, and I vex, and then I had to stop and just say, just forgive yourself for allowing somebody to not only scrape your car, but scrape your consciousness. And the car can fix, but by somebody else, but I have to fix the consciousness. Not enough to say I forgive you, we must say and mean it, and go the extra mile to prove it. And so my friends, I want us just to end by affirming I put God first in 2020, year of plenty. Can we say that? I put God first in 2020, year of plenty, and I joyfully reap the fruits of spirit.